Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's very seldom that a mom gets to talk to all of the people who take care of her son. I was 27 years old when Terry was born 40 years ago. I was healthy, married, I had a great pregnancy, I delivered by natural childbirth. Labor is well named, ladies, yes? <laughs> and I was not prepared for a child who had multiple congenital anomalies. What was obvious immediately is that he had two clubbed feet, very unusual, it's usually one. And then soon after that he had pyloric stenosis. We started with um, casts on his feet, which is a very long, very painful, drawn out process. And things were actually fairly smooth. Uh, I vowed I would never put him away, you've heard that phrase. And he was eight months old, and I was five months pregnant with his sister when the orthopedist said to me, we have more serious problems than his feet, and we're very, very concerned that he is mentally retarded. That was the term back then. And you know, you see in cartoons where people see stars if they're hit in the head with a baseball bat. I saw stars, I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't imagine it. But I vowed that I would be the best mother of a child with disabilities that ever was. And I'm a pretty tough cookie, and I did the best I could for a long time. Ten days before he went into the first surgery on his feet, they were going to do one leg at a time because it was so serious, his father, of our two children, got in his sailboat, sailed away. We've never seen him since. That was 1974. So, The surgery was traumatic enough, but he went into respiratory arrest in the course of the surgery. They decided to do both feet because they had no idea what had happened. And in fact, it was not until 25 years later when I had him completely reevaluated. My daughter was of childbearing age. I wanted to be sure that there was not a chromosomal abnormality, which they had suspected back then, but not proven. And. Um, he came out uh, a wild man, absolutely a wild man. He weighed 50 pounds dead weight. He could break furniture with his bare hands. He did not sleep for one year. And we had moved into a house, and the mortgage was three times what our rent had been, and two-thirds of our income had sailed into the sunset. I had to get two more jobs. Thankfully, I had a marvelous person at home to help me care for him, but it wore me down and I was on my knees with exhaustion and frustration. This child never slept, was a, just a wild man. So it's an agonizing decision for parents to make. It's just an, it's, it, I was ashamed, defeated, but I, I knew that I had to have help, and I did then find a wonderful, wonderful home for him. I was living in Mobile, Alabama at the time, in Montgomery. Uh, literally a mom-and-pop operation, mom-and-pop people at Pineview Manor had 65 children, and it was a marvelous place. I thought he would be there forever, which is a key point I want to talk about later in connection with Lexington. Um, pop people refused to become certified for Medicaid. The state squeezed him. He had to close. In the meantime, I had moved to New York, was divorced, moved to New York, and uh, I had to find a place for him in very short order. We moved him to home in Queens, which I thought would be okay, and he got settled, and I went home to Mobile, where my parents were still living, to have surgery and convalesce, and I got a call from the emergency room of a hospital in Queens, and they said the home dropped him off, and they're not coming back. And he said, we're not exactly equipped in the emergency room to serve meals, but this boy has quite an appetite. And 
this is not really an appropriate place for him to be, but he's fascinated with the scene. He loves the goings-on in the emergency room, and we shut the curtain, and he swings it open. Yeah! Like the action in the emergency room. And he said, and obviously he loves clothes. I gave him a surgeon's top, and he won't give it back to me. I want to give him a clean one, but I can't get it back. Any suggestions? Can't communicate. Exactly. Exactly. So I got home as soon as I could. Uh, he moved to a third place in the Bronx, which was good for a while, but they started to close, and he began to deteriorate. And uh, lost 30 pounds and a couple of teeth, and... Um, I was at my wit's end. I crisscrossed the state of New York. There's no real coordination about what's available and what, what the resources are. And I could not find any place for him. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. So now we come to the story of Lexington. Because two friends of mine, I was in the life insurance business at the time and, and launching a career in financial planning and investments. Two friends of mine called Tom Wheeler, who was CEO of the Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company, and they said, Barbara um, is falling apart and she needs help. And he called me and he said, I think I can help you. We have a person in Washington whose name is Barry Goderer. He was Mayor Lindsay's right-hand man in the 70s. He knows New York like nobody knows New York. And within a week, Barry called me and he said, I found a wonderful place. And you can go up there and see what you think. So I drove, uh, I hate to drive, but I drove from New York City in a blinding snowstorm. Now I know that lately you've been through a hurricane, a tornado, and an earthquake. This was a mere blinding snowstorm. But it was at night, and it was very dark, and there were no lights, and I was weaving all over the place, and a cop car came out of nowhere and pulled me over, and he said, Lady, are you drinking? I said, No, but I'm going to be drinking as soon as I get to the Holiday Inn in Johnstown. <laughs> Could you show me the way? So I thought it was the most wonderful place I'd seen. This was the fourth place, and it was the most wonderful place I'd seen, but I wondered if they would take Terry. And at the time, he was very, very um, subdued. He was depressed. He was absolutely depressed, not himself at all. And we went to the first of our wonderful homes here. He got settled. I got home. They called and said, uh, the floodgates have opened. He's, he just went berserk. And I drove back up here thinking they're not going to keep him, they're not going to keep him. And they did, they meaning all of you. And we've gradually moved from one place to another as his needs moved. But Judy mentioned peace of mind. And when he's well taken care of, because my job as his mom because I cannot take care of him, is to be sure that he's well taken care of. That's my job. There's always a tug at my heart. There's always going to be sadness. There's always going to be the question of whether I could have done a better job. But I couldn't. So when he's well taken care of, I sleep. And when he isn't, I'm a crazy person. So this, it's 21 years here that I've been coming to visit, and I have never... Y'all have never missed a beat. There's never been a cause for concern. You can't imagine how amazing that is considering what we have gone through to get here. And the other remarkable thing is that Lexington has a life longer than my life. And you see, Terry will outlive me. And now I do very sophisticated estate planning within my financial planning practice. And we're always talking about the next generation. Well, Terry will outlive me. And while his brother and sister love him and will watch out, and I, I, I have to know that there's a plan that's bigger than us. And I, when the first person who helped me at Lexington was promoted, I cried buckets. I thought, this is it. Nobody will ever advocate for me. And then I met Barbara and I, and 
Um, I will tell you, if she sent an email saying that she'd gotten married, and I didn't quite read the whole last name. I thought, Barbara married Paul? <laughs> she corrected me. She said, no, Barbara, it's Nigra. I said, okay. So, I've lived through having to move Terry, and it's very, very, very difficult because he loves his routine, and he loves his home. It's the same... It's the same situation. He's very anxious to... We used to leave a good bit. We don't do that now. But, but he's always glad to come home. He's very safe. It's obvious in his face. And the fact that I can die and not worry about what's going to happen to him because Lexington will go on. The infrastructure here, if you can get a sense of it, is remarkable and so unusual. And it's always growing. Every time I come to a board meeting, there's a new program, a new idea, a new way of dealing with problems. And so it, it's, it, it has a life of its own, which means that my son will be taken care of when, when, I'm, when I've left this earth and I'm under whatever my next adventure might be. I don't know how to say thank you. So, from my, except that from my point of view, I'm a happy workaholic. I take care of four generations of family. I travel a lot. Um, I love my life. And I could not have a life without you. That's just... I don't know. I don't know if any of you experience, if you have a little angel somewhere that kind of looks out for you and helps you do what you need to do. Uh, I'm a big believer in positive energy. I think that if, if your energy is really good and you concentrate on being happy, no matter how bad it is out there, that there's a space for good things to come. And Lexington is one of those, the biggest, the biggest thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>